Okay, the recording is on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 308, our course on um, Revelation and Daniel. I trust um, all of you have had a good week so far. Today is Friday, uh, last day of the work week. Uh, let's uh, just pray together and then we will get started in our class. Um, can I request somebody to please pray with the class and then we'll start? Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, in this morning. Mm -hmm. Just uh, We come before you, Lord, uh, as we are going to learn from your word, Lord, help us to understand and you are the one who uh, will uh, who will give us the well understanding and you will reveal the deep uh, revelation thank you we submit in your hand holy spirit uh, lead us in this time lord also i pray all the students or pastor thank you i pray in jesus name amen amen amen, amen. okay good morning and welcome once again so uh, we are looking at the book of Daniel. Um, today we will finish the book of Daniel and uh, maybe we may even start uh, uh, Revelation today. Now, what I want to do is I want to uh, just pick up from chapter 10 uh, uh, and then you know, go all the way to the end, um, chapter 12, um, and then uh, before we move to Revelation, just do a quick overview, highlight a few things uh, from Daniel. Now, in Daniel chapter 10, uh, uh, I just missed pointing out something. Uh, uh, in chapter 10 itself, there is, um, you know, we're not seeing uh, any prophetic uh, end time prophecy in chapter 10. So we didn't uh, we didn't really read through chapter ten, but uh, uh, what I do want to point out is from chapter ten is that uh, uh, as uh, Daniel is uh, praying, you know, uh, he has had these visions which he has shared with us, um, and uh, he's praying about this. Um, chapter ten, uh, verse one. Uh, uh, Daniel is, you know, uh, he's he's really thinking about this uh, this message and this vision. Uh, what we see is that um, the angel Gabriel, or, or the angel of the Lord, yeah, this angel of the Lord uh, appears, comes to Daniel in the vision, right? And uh, um, what what I do want to point out now, this is not uh, this is not uh, uh, end time prophecy. It's just a side, uh, just of some observations, or you'd say like a side note uh, from chapter ten. Is that um, uh, we get a little bit of insight into the spiritual realm, the angelic realm, uh, the realm uh, of the unseen world, the spirit world, uh, in chapter ten, right? And uh, so the angel Gabriel. Uh, um, this is in verse 11. Uh, it doesn't necessarily point out him as uh, uh, Gabriel right here, but we understand because Gabriel is the one who has come before and has spoken to Daniel. Uh, so uh, the angel speaks to Daniel. He says in verse 11, you know, uh, from the time, verse 12, from the time you started, from the day, from the first day, Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, from the first day that you started praying and asking God for an understanding of the vision, I was sent from heaven. So he says, you know, uh, uh, so basically the day Daniel started praying, God dispatched the answer, meaning the messenger was sent, the messenger angel was sent. But then we get, an, uh, get some insight in verse 13 of the spiritual realm. Or what's happening in the spirit world. Okay, so this is not end time prophecy. It's just an observation, like a side note. Uh, verse 13, Daniel 10, verse 13, he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia 
withstood me 21 days or opposed me for 21 days. Now he says the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Obviously, he, he's not referring to the physical ruler on the earth because this is an angelic being. So it's not that the physical ruler on earth of Persia uh, you know, stopped the angel, but he's talking about a spiritual being who was interfering or hindering this heavenly angel from getting across to Daniel. And then it says, Michael, one of the chief princes, and we will see Michael once again later, but he says, Michael, who's a chief prince. So there is the prince of Persia. Then there is Michael, who is a chief prince, one of the chief princes. So that means there are many of these chief princes. Michael is one of them. Um, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So in that one verse, in verse 13, there is the prince of Persia. There is Michael, the chief prince. And there are the kings of Persia. I want you to see that. And all of these are referring to angelic beings, not, uh, you know, I mean, spirit beings, not physical, because these are angels in action. So the angel was sent. Then the prince of Persia was stopping him, along with the kings of Persia. That means other demonic beings. And then Michael, the chief, one of the chief angel comes and helps him. I'm using the word him, but helps this angel come on and get through to Daniel. So we see here in this verse, this hierarchy of uh, spiritual beings, which, you know, we are familiar with Ephesians 6 verse 12. Uh, the Bible talks about principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness and spirits of wickedness in heavenly places, meaning there's this hierarchy, and we are seeing this in, um, you know, this being played out here for us in verse 13. And very interesting, this is in the Old Testament, you know, uh, where we are seeing this, we're getting this insight into the spirit, spirit world, and how there are these demonic beings, which in this case would be the prince of Persia, the kings of Persia, who are opposing this angelic messenger, and Michael, who's a chief prince, comes and helps him. So it also gives us understanding that there are demonic powers over regions and territories like this. And uh, uh, later on, in verse 20, uh, the same angel also refers to the prince of Persia and also refers to the prince of Greece. So he's not just talking about the prince of Persia, but he's talking about the prince of Greece. Um, and uh, and then in verse 21, he refers to Michael as your prince, meaning the prince over Israel. That means Michael is the archangel who is assigned to Israel. So we're seeing that there are angelic beings, good angels, bad, bad or fallen angels who are territorial, you know, they uh, they operate specifically over certain regions and so on. So we get that observation from chapter 10. It's just a side note. Uh, I don't want, it's not, you know, not in time Bible prophecy, uh, but just something for you and me to keep in mind, right? Uh, in chapter 11, we did not read chapter 11. Uh, I just mentioned in passing that uh, uh, Daniel chapter 11 is uh, like a uh, 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 Daniel's prophecy where he goes through starting from uh, the, the Medes and the Persians to the Greek the, the Greek kingdom Alexander the Great and then on to talking about the northern kingdom which are the kings of Syria and the southern kingdom, which are the kings of Egypt. And he actually talks about what will happen. And historically, it was fulfilled. And I've just given you the history. Now, um, uh, you know, for us, it may not be uh, very interesting. I mean, it's just a series of, you know, historical kings who did things that Daniel spoke of. 
But what is very uh, uh, notable is Daniel prophesied about what was going to happen. And this is where, um, you know, uh, uh, many people have problems with Daniel chapter 11 because they're saying, wow, how could he have prophesied uh, in such uh, detail and with such accuracy about kings yet to come several hundred years into the future? Uh, which were fulfilled, you know, and historically when you list all the kings of um, the kings of Syria, the kings of Egypt, right succeeding, you know, right after uh, 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 Alexander, the Greek empire and so on, you find it all fulfilled. And so that is very, very uh, astounding part of Daniel 11. Now, where we want to focus on is from verse 35 okay, of Daniel 11. So uh, uh, I, I left that part out, uh, but we will pick up from there because now he's jumping through time. So there is a near fulfillment. That means all he has said from Daniel chapter 11, from verse 1 all the way to verse 35, were things that were fulfilled in history uh, that were closer to the time of Daniel, or from Daniel on. And then he jumps in time to the very end, the end times. So that we pick up from the end of verse 35 on till the end of chapter 12. So that's of interest to us because that is concerning end time prophecy. Okay. So the near fulfillment, I've given you the list of historical kings uh, that already was fulfilled. But we're going to pick up from verse 35. Okay, Daniel chapter 11, 35, and then we go on uh, to reading. So in from verse 35 onwards, he shifts and says, okay, this is what's going to happen in the future. And he starts talking about the Antichrist, who he has already informed us in chapters 7, 8, and 9. You remember that uh, he has spoken to us about, you know, in chapter 7, where he sees the four beasts or the animal-like creature, animal creatures uh, from the fourth beast, which was the representing, you know, the parallel that we see was the Roman Empire, parallel to the the, the the feet of iron. Here's the image. Uh, there were ten horns that came out, parallel to the ten toes, uh, in of Daniel uh, of chapter two, the image in chapter two. So the ten horns came, and then there was another little horn that came that began to speak, you know, uh, pompous, boastful things against God of heaven. And so then Daniel begins to explain that this, he tells us a lot of things in chapter seven, eight and nine, he tells us that this, this little beast, which of course refers to the anti, antichrist, he speaks against the prince of the most high. That means he speaks against Jesus Christ. He, he uh, goes after, he persecutes uh, the people of God. He uh, stops the sacrifices that are in the temple. He desecrates the temple. He um, uh, he also uh, you know he makes it peace treaty. This is in chapter nine. He makes a covenant for one week, but in the middle of the week he breaks the covenant. So all these things uh, we have Daniel has already spoken about the Antichrist in chapter seven, eight, and nine. He has explained it to us. Now we are going to read some more of the kinds of things that are going to happen. Right? So verse 35, um, uh, he says, you know, and some of those understand, some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. So while he has been speaking about all the historical kings and all that, end of verse 35, what I want to point out is he now goes shifting focus till until the time of the end. 
until the time of the end because it is still for the appointed time. So he's now shifting to time of the end, appointed time. Then from verse 36 starts uh, about the time of the end, right? So uh, let's read uh, from verse 36 onwards, uh, two verses, okay? Uh, um, um, okay, maybe we just go, go through it two by two. I mean, verse 36 and 37, somebody can read and I'll make some comments. Somebody can read verses 36 and 37. The king will do as he please, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than every god, even bless meaning blessing the God of gods, he will succeed, but only until the time of birth is completed. For what has been determined will surely take place. He will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors or for the god loved by women or for my other god. For he will boast that he is greater than them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So verse 36 starts off with the word then. That means when? At the time of the end, at the appointed time. So that is out in the future. Then. That means at that time, in the appointed time, this this kind of person will come. Right? Uh, a king will do according to his own will. So the king, you know, we must, like I mentioned, I think, last week, uh, when we talk about the word king, it doesn't necessarily mean a monarch, as was understood in Bible times. It could just, you know, just meaning a leader, a person in authority, right? So we translate Bible language because it was written in the language and the culture and the context of the writer. We have to translate that to the time of when it's going to be fulfilled. So it's not necessarily a monarch, but it's a leader, person of influence and power and authority. So he will do according to his own will. He uh, he will, you know, just do what he wants. Uh, he's going to speak blasphemies against God. So this very much parallels or similar to uh, what he has already told us about the Antichrist in earlier chapters, chapters um, 7, 8, 9. Right? So mainly 7 and 8, uh, we have a lot of details. So he speaks blasphemies against God. God, uh, but he's going to succeed in all this until the time. That means, you know, this is obviously God is letting this happen here uh, for that period of time. So he's going to blaspheme God. He's not going to worry about any earthly God or the gods that people worship or women worship or any, any, any God because his goal is to set himself up as God. You know, and when we go to Revelation chapter 13, that's exactly what he'll do. The Antichrist will set himself up as God to be worshipped. So he doesn't, he's not going to care about anything. He's going to speak against God. He's going to set himself up as God. Because ultimately behind the Antichrist is Satan. So Antichrist is basically Satan's representative. And if he gets people to worship him, they're actually worshipping Satan, right? Um, so he's going to exalt himself above everything, right? That's verse 37. Um, so let's uh, let's go till verse 39, 38, 39, please. Daniel 11, 38, 39. But in their place, right, come on. 38 instance of this, he will worship a God fortress, a God his ancestor never knew, and lavish on him gold, silver, precious stones, and expensive gifts, claiming this foreign God's help. He will attack the strongest fortress fortress he will honor those who submit to him appointing them to position of authority and div dividing the land among them as their reward mm, okay so uh, daniel was saying that 
he's going to be empowered by this powerful God. And he just refers to it as a foreign God. So obviously, you know, Daniel, at that point, Daniel doesn't know that this foreign God, meaning this totally unknown God is actually uh, Satan himself. But, uh, you know, so this Antichrist, this man who's speaking blasphemies against God is going to honor really his, when he talks about gold and silver precious, so it's an expression of honor. He's going to honor this foreign God, this outside realm God. And he's going to, you know, um, uh, 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 empower all the people who are helping him, that means the Antichrist, carry out his uh, agenda. So all those who join with him, he's going to, you know, help them out, give them land, uh, uh, divide the land for gain and so on. Okay, And around, and so at, at this time, what will happen, uh, verse 40 and 41 is, so Antichrist by this time has established himself in Jerusalem there in a seven years peace treaty. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, we get some insight of what, what will happen. Verse 40 and 41. Or till 42. When the king, when the king of Syria, final honor, uh, honor uh, hour has almost come, the king of Egypt will attack him, and the king of Syria will fight back with all his power using chariots, horses, and many ships. He will invade many countries like the waters of a flood. He will even invade the promised land and kill tens of thousands. But the country of Edom, Moab, and what is left in a uh, lived of Ammon will uh, escape. Mm, and verse forty-two also. Verse forty-two: When he invades all those countries, even Egypt will not be. Spirit. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is as this man is, you know, uh, Antichrist doing all these things, uh, Syria from the north and Egypt from the east are going to move in to oppose him um, uh, uh, in, in what he is doing. Uh, but he is, and he's also, it says verse 41, he will also enter the promised land. So the Antichrist is coming in to the promised land and he's, he's, he's basically setting himself up as God, right? So he, in the process, he's going to anger many people. And then we come into Revelation, uh, we will see uh, chapter 17 and 18, uh, that in chapter 17, that this, this, there is this religious system which the Antichrist has been backing. So there is a false prophet who we will see, obviously, is representing some sort of a religious figure who is, you know, the Antichrist and the false prophet are hand in hand. Uh, the false prophet is promoting the quote unquote religion of the Antichrist, getting people to worship him. So obviously, that's going to anger a lot of people. In Revelation 17, we are seeing that support for the false prophet suddenly collapses. You know, these 10 leaders who were once supporting the Antichrist and this false prophet just withdraw. And so this whole religious system collapses. Uh, so we will see that in the book of Revelation. But here what we're seeing is people from Syria from the north, Egypt from the south are attacking. The Antichrist is taking over the promised land. And... But then, you know, it's it's interesting to see here in verse 41 that is, it mentions Edom, Moab, and Ammon will escape out of his hand. So Edom, Moab, and Ammon are the people, of course, from the Old Testament, but it refers to the people right today in current modern-day Jordan, which is just neighboring the land of Israel. Okay, So it seems like people who go off over there will escape. You know, now that that is an interesting thing because when we come to Revelation, Revelation twelve, it tells us that uh, the people of Israel will actually be will go into a desert place and they will be preserved uh, for one thousand two hundred and sixty days. That's uh, you know approximately three and a half years, 
uh, during the second half of the tribulation, they will be preserved, uh, even though the Antichrist is going after them. So it seems to indicate, if you put this along with that together, that there will probably be some Israel Israelis or people of Israel who will escape into the neighboring country of Jordan, which is the land of Eden, Moab, and Ammon. They will escape there so that you know they could uh, save their lives. And uh, very specifically in uh, Zechariah chapter 13, uh, it tells us very clearly that about two thirds of the Jews will remain in Israel, they'll be destroyed. But one third who escape, you know, they'll be preserved. So, you know, when we put Zechariah 13 along with here, Daniel 11 and Revelation 12, you can piece those pictures together. But there will be people, you know, who escape. So that's of interest to us. But he says, Egypt, verse 42, Egypt will not escape. You know, so there's going to be all of this war happening. And then let's finish up the last few verses, uh, 43 to 45, Daniel 11, 43 to 45. Now, all these things I'm saying, uh, they're in the notes, okay? So uh, you can always go back and read the PDF, what I'm saying, uh, but uh, uh, I'm just explaining it now. Okay, 43 to 45. He shall have power over the desert, of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, also the Lebanese and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But, uh, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great pull to destroy and animate many and he shall plant the tenth of his places between the seas and the glorious holy mountain yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him thank you so verse 43 um, it says like he shall have power over treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things that's again very interesting. It's talking about how he's going to have control over, you know, gold, silver, precious things, money, wealth. And we see, we know, Revelation 13, what happens when the Antichrist comes, he's going to introduce a system where nobody can buy or sell except they have the mark of the beast. Right? So that means in some way he's going to take control or have influence over the financial system, Revelation 13. And here Daniel is saying he's going to have power over the wealth. And so we see that in Revelation 13. But when you come to Revelation 18, just before the end, this whole financial system will collapse. And all the people, all the wealth, all the, you know, everything will just disappear. Disappear, so it will become of no value uh, overnight. Right, so he's going to have control over all these things, which we know he, he does, Revelation 13. But we also know Revelation 18, it will all collapse. Okay, So it says that even Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, meaning these other nations, uh, African nations, all there will be nations that are being controlled by him. Verse 44 is interesting because it says, news from the east and the north will trouble him. And when you come to Revelation, you see, we will see this. Um, and when the, uh, in, in, in Revelation 16, uh, there is this movement of the armies from the east. They are moving in towards Megiddo or the valley in the northern part, uh, uh, the valley in the in the northern part of Israel for the battle of Armageddon. So you have this army, the kings from the east moving in 
in Revelation 16. So obviously, here it says, news from the east will trouble them. So there's, there's this huge army coming in. He's going to be troubled. And from the north, we, see, we will see that Russia is going to begin to move from the north. So here he says in verse 44, news from the east and the north will trouble him. And uh, we can see in the book of Revelation, uh, although the Bible doesn't mention who are the countries, it just says there's going to be the kings of the east moving in. You know, we could or we could speculate or maybe, you know, with within some reason think that this may be most likely China because it's uh, the biggest, largest country east of the promised land and north, of course, Russia coming in, right? So it's going to trouble him and uh, he's going to go out with great fury to try to destroy. So there's going to be this clash and this fight happening, which when we come to the book of Revelation, it's the battle of Armageddon. But verse 45, he's going to make his headquarters on the glorious holy mountain, which is Jerusalem, between the seas. Right? So uh, verse 45, or uh, the, the Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem. Uh, so the Antichrist is going to take Try and you know he's going to make Jerusalem his headquarters, but it says yet he shall come to his hand, and no one will help him. So that is the end. You know when the Lord Jesus comes, Revelation chapter nineteen tells us very clearly how the Lord will destroy, you know, uh, and destroy him, uh, destroy the Antichrist and overthrow him. The the beast and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so these are things we can see here. It will be much more clearer when we go into the into the book of Revelation, but we can you know draw. Uh, we can see the parallel. Now, just keep in mind that Daniel wrote the things he saw, what he was told, um, in the language and in the context of his time. You know, with what he understood, he wrote it down. But when we compare this with the book of Revelation, you know, it becomes a lot more clearer for us. Okay. Uh, is everyone with me so far before we start chapter 12? Uh, any questions on, uh, on this last portion of chapter 11? Okay. Everyone's okay? Sir, uh... Well, Go ahead, Prince. Like, yeah. He is uh, saying that uh, he will controlling everything. Like uh, his, uh, he will uh, gold and silver, everything he will yet take it. And but now in this time, we will see uh, the Bitcoin. Mm. This is the controlling everything, the money. Uh, so uh, it's a good question. Now, here's what I would say. You know, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say. Okay, just the fact that Bitcoin itself is uh, is the thing, but I think the movement that we are seeing globally towards a digital currency. You know, the movement that we are seeing everywhere towards digital currency, whatever form it may be, whether it's uh, Bitcoin, which has its own way of working, or even, you know, in, in, in all our transactions today, we are we're not necessarily using paper money. I mean, there is paper money. You can have Indian rupees or US dollars or coins, but people are doing a lot of things digitally. Bitcoin has, is, is part of this whole digital currency space. And even, you know, like here in India, they're trying to introduce the digital rupee, you know, or the government just, just speaking about it, saying we're going to in, in, introduce digital rupee, which will be equivalent to the paper money, but this is digital format. So we are, we are actually going into uh, completely, or not, I would not say completely, but moving more and more into 
this digital currency, which is going to make it easier for control. I mean, first of all, it's going to make it easier for all of us to be connected with each other financially. You know, as it is, the global markets are very interdependent on each other. Something happens, you know, in some part of the world, you know, uh, it affects prices and affects economies in other parts of the world because we are so connected. And moving to a digital currency will, you know, uh, more and more, it's going to make us even more connected. Which also means that it's easier for somebody to be able to control or somebody or something, some entity to control things digitally. You know, it's no longer dependent on you having a paper currency of a paper currency of that type. It's not needed. So for instance, sitting here in India, uh, uh, we can, you know, we can transact in almost any currency in the world. You can transact in US dollars or, you know, pounds or Australian dollars or Malaysian ringgit. We don't have to have the physical currency with us. We can buy and sell online, uh, you know, in whichever currency you want, if you have a card or some means for transacting online. So we don't need that paper with us. So uh, it is a good observation. And my answer would be, yeah, it's all facilitating or it's all moving towards something where Revelation 13 can be even more easily fulfilled. And if you look back in time, say maybe 30 years ago, before the internet, this would not be possible. It would be very difficult. But within 30 years, so much has changed financially that today it's possible. It's Revelation 13, where the Antichrist, or, you know, when he says nobody can buy and sell unless we have the mark of the beast. Well, it is, you know, you some if somebody is powerful enough, they could make it happen, you know, because of the financial markets and things that are in place. And just in 30 years, 30, 35 years, things have changed so much. Okay. Um, Aaron asks the question. Okay, thanks. Can you please explain verse 44? Yeah. So uh, verse 44, it says, News from the east and the north will trouble him. So he is, uh, you know, he's put himself up on the glorious holy mountain, which is Jerusalem. Okay, so you think Antichrist now, uh, he's come into Jerusalem, he's put himself up in the temple, uh, being the, be, wanting to be the one to be worshipped and all of that. He's operating there. News from the east, so east of Israel. I think, and then we compare it with Revelation chapter 16, where there the armies of the East, or the kings of the East, who are moving in. And let me give you the exact words there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, this is in verse 14. Um, uh, Sorry, verse, uh, verse uh, 12. Revelation 16, 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So kings from the east coming in, right? Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12. So what's happening? Uh, Revelation 16, 12 says that kings from the east, east of Israel, nations, leaders, are coming in from the east. Um, and it says in verse 14, kings of the earth, of the whole world, they're gathering together to the great day of battle. Revelation 16, 14. Revelation 16, 16, it refers to Armageddon. Hear that? So the kings of the east are spoken of in Revelation 16, 12. And this you can compare with Daniel 11, 44. News from the east troubles him. Because that means... There is this movement of armies, kings of the earth from the east. And uh, 
a major country, a major nation. The east of Israel is, of course, China, but there are a lot of other countries as well who probably all get together and say, we are going to go against this man. Right? And then from the north, news from the east and from the north. So north, north of Israel, uh, the largest, I'm not saying the only, but the largest nation from the north who could move in from the north is Russia. And of course, there will be the allies, which means other, other Arab nations who would all get together to come against the Antichrist. And so that's spoken of here in Revelation 16, which is the build up for the battle of Armageddon. Is that okay, Aaron? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions so far? Okay. All right. So now, all this is happening. And this is all ha during the tribulation, but more specifically in the second half of the tribulation. Right? Because in the first half of the tribulation, the first seven years, we know that he, he, he sets up a p treaty, a peace treaty, a covenant for seven years. So things are going to be kind of peaceful the first, but in the middle of the seven, seven days, or seven years, he breaks the covenant. And that's when, uh, you know, all these things begin to happen. Right, so the first three and a half years, uh, he's trying to be this man of peace, a covenant. But in the middle, he sets himself up in the temple of God. We know this from Daniel chapter nine and verse twenty-seven, and he sets himself up to be worshipped, and he uh, suddenly changes. That's when all the trouble starts. So this second part of this tribulation. Uh, we see different terms used in the Bible. Uh, it is referred to as the Great Tribulation. It is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble from Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 4 to 8, 4 to 11. It is also referred to as the times of the Gentiles. Right? So I've given that in the notes. So that's the second half of the tribulation. It's also known by these terms in scripture. And so chapter 12, verse 1, begins like this. At that time. What time is he talking about? The second half of the tribulation. When, you know, when the previous verses, that means when this man, Antichrist, is, you know, he's speaking all these blasphemous things about God and... Uh, setting himself up to be worshipped and uh, uh, doing all these things. When all these things are happening at that time, that is during uh, the second half of the tribulation, it says, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Right? So Michael, so he is the archangel who is watching over Israel. So like, we, like I mentioned earlier, uh, from chapter 10, there is the prince of Persia, there is the prince of Greece, there are the kings of Persia. So like that, there are these uh, demonic powers or angelic beings, fallen angels who are watching over these uh, nations. Here he's talking, chapter 12, verse 1, he's telling us, Mike, Kill the great prince. That means he's a chief prince. He's an archangel. He is watching over Israel. So that doesn't mean he's doing it alone. Of course, under him are all the other angelic armies. But he, Michael is the archangel who's in charge of that territory, Israel. Okay. So he's going to rise up. What's, what's going to happen? I'm reading on in verse 1. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, 
even to that time. That So he's telling, hey, this is going to be the worst time on earth ever. Talking about the great tribulation period. Right? There will be so much trouble like there's never was since the time nations were formed on the earth. It's going to be so bad. So that's why we say, you know, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the great tribulation, the times of the Gentiles. Uh, it's going to be uh, a lot of confusion. We will see when we come to the book of Revelation, all the things that are, that, are, that are said will happen in the second half of the great tribulation, in the second half of the tribulation, which is the great tribulation. But here it's telling us in verse 1, there'll be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who's found written in the book. So it's saying, look, at that time, your people will be delivered. That means there will be some who will be destroyed or who will be killed. And there'll be some who will be preserved. God will preserve some of the Jewish people or the people of Israel. And we see this again uh, in parallel to, like we said in Revelation 12, where God will preserve them for 1,260 days, keep them, protect them. God will do that. Then verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, that is, who die, uh, will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. So he is looking ahead in time uh, to the when uh, everyone is raised back to life, uh, and uh, there is those who are going to be assured into eternity and to life and those who are going to be sent away into an eternal hell. So, and it says, and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars for they're, they're going to be people who are shining forever. So, uh, verses two and three. So there's going to be, at the end of the seven year tribulation, Jesus is going to come. And what we will see in Revelation 20 is that those who, were, who died during the tribulation would be raised up, end of the tribulation. And they will live through the millennium. But at the end of the thousand years, every person will be raised up. Revelation 20, verses 13, 14, 15. End of the tribulation. Every person, the Bible says, the sea gave up its dead. Ever, and they will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? So those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. So verse 2, uh, uh, to me, that seems to be a picture of what Revelation 20 14 to 15 is talking about the great white throne judgment, where every person, every living person will be alive. And, you know, that's the final judgment. And uh, those who are wise, they're going to shine uh, forever, like the stars forever. They're going to be in that eternal kingdom, new heavens and the new earth. You're going to be ushered in there. That's Revelation 21 and 22. Okay, so we will look at that. But it's very interesting that Daniel is given an understanding of what is going to happen about the eternal, the final judgment and beyond. Okay? He just describes it like this in verse 3. They're going to shine like the stars forever and ever. Okay, uh, I know this, the time is up for this first hour. Uh, we're going to pause here. Uh, we'll take a break and come back. And uh, if you have any questions with these first three verses, uh, you're welcome to ask. And then we will just you know, finish 
the rest of chapter 12 and maybe do an introduction to Revelation. Okay, so let's take a break and we will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>